Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We've got a fun two-part interview coming your way, covering a wide range of chess topics, and we will get you to the interviews momentarily. But first, a couple things. Number one, update on my book, Perpetual Chess Improvement. It is now available on Kindle and Forward Chess. Um, as I record this, Amazon still is not shipping. Amazon supposedly famed for their logistics, but slacking on sending the actual book. But the book will be available from Amazon uh, at November 15th at the latest. Uh, and you can get it from Chess for Less. You can get it from New In Chess. Um, or you can wait or you can not order it. Whatever you want. But so far, hearing good things, good feedback about the book. Happy to report that. Um, so if you're interested, please pick it up. Uh, next up, Chessable shout out. Silman's Endgame course is finally on Chessable. This is not a drill. I am Alex Bonzea, does the presentation for the video version. Great and popular Chessable presenter. And it's funny because in my book, I talk, I have a chapter about Endgames. Um and I talk about how it's sort of the one-stop shopping book for end games, especially if you're rated, say, below 2,000. You, it covers so many end games, wide range of levels. Someone, of course, legendary writer, very personable, uh, doesn't make it feel like work when you're learning. Um, and, but in my book, I recommend it as the one thing to get, except I lamented that it wasn't on Chessable because a lot of these basic end games, like the Lucina position and so on, they're very uh, well suited to space repetition in terms of learning and practicing them. So our National Nightmare is over, or International Nightmare in this case, and Soman's Endgame course is on Chessable, along with all their other great stuff, so be sure to check out what they have to offer. Um, as for this week's episode, just to do a quick intro of what we have coming, um, we're first up going to do a rundown on the FIDE Grand Swiss. Obviously, covering chess news is not sort of the main drive of perpetual chess, but certain tournaments rise above the fray, and for me in particular... The world championship cycle rises above the fray. Even without Magnus, I find myself pulled in repeatedly to, you know, hearing who's going to be in the candidates and thinking about who's going to play Ding Loren. And because the FIDE Grand Swiss just took place and because that means there are two uh, newly minted uh, participants for the FIDE candidate cycle in the open and two more in the women's section. Um, I wanted to run down the tournament. It was a fun tournament to follow. I always love these big open tournaments. So brought in friend of the pod, uh, candidate master Vyacheslav Niemets, who was following the tournament super closely and is always insightful. So the first half of this pod is me and Vieco running down everything that happened in the FIDE Grand Swiss, as well as giving you some homework of like other interviews and you should watch and games you should go review and so on. There's always so much to digest from that sort of like, you know, 14 day storm of chess that takes place. I think it was only 12 days, actually, but you get the idea. So that's part one. Part two, we catch up with old time friend, long time friend of the pod, Chris Callahan of Lee Chess. Obviously, uh, Lee Chess, just an amazing resource to have. Um, and it's always fun to hear sort of what's going on behind the scenes. Obviously, they're donation driven, volunteer driven. So uh, as with so many things in chess, it takes a a real village. It takes a lot of community to keep an entity like Lee Chess firing. So Chris and I get into the finances of Lee Chess, uh, what projects they're working on, both sort of on the technical end and on sort of the uh, community slash social end. We talk about the stuff where Lee Chess uh, stopped partnering with U.S. Chess and the St. Louis Chess Club. Um, so always good to hear what's going on with our friends at Lee Chess. Um, and as always, there are detailed uh, show notes where you can see a, where the guest interviews are, and B, what topics were discussed, and jump around if you like. Um, but on that note, we will get you to the two interviews. So uh, first up is Vyacheslav Nemitz, and second is Chris Callahan talking Lee Chess. Uh, one other note is because the FIDE Grand Swiss talk is a bit news-oriented, um, I might release this pod a little bit earlier than usual. Usually we release pods every Tuesday. Um, if this one comes out early, then we'll be going back to the regular schedule for the November 21st episode. So without further ado, here are the conversations. And we are rejoined here by a friend of the pod, Vyacheslav Nemec, who is a candidate master, chessable author, blogger, trainer, and avid chess fan who has been chronicling every moment of the FIDE Grand Swiss on 
uh, X slash Twitter, uh, basically doing daily threads of the games that stood out to him, both in the open and the women's section. So I uh, wanted to discuss this uh, landmark, fascinating tournament, and Vieco was a great person to do that with. So welcome back to the pod, Vieco. Hi, Ben. Uh, nice to meet you again, and thanks for having me again. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for joining me. I know that you are on the road and appreciate you beaming in from the Netherlands. Um, and we will get to discussing the tournament in a matter of moments, but I did just want to kind of review the top line news from it. It was quite an entertaining tournament with a nice mix of sort of uh, surprise results and uh, less surprising results. So uh, a lot of listeners may have heard this stuff, but hopefully we have a few nuggets of information that uh, you'll find useful, and then we'll get to some discussion. So of course, the winner in the open section is Grandmaster Vita Gujarati. Um, you know, I'm really happy for him. He's always been class act, hardworking, great representative for chess. And th- I love the arc of uh, of this victory as we will discuss but so he wins eighty thousand dollars he gets a coveted candidate spot he hit a new peak reading rating of uh 2737 at age 29 so just a great story for read it that i'm sure we will be diving into played amazing chess as well of course as you must to win a tournament of this strength coming in second hikaru nakamura so he also gets a candidate spot he had kind of pole position on winning the rating spot anyway, but I'm sure it's a relief for him to be able to sort of take his foot off the gas and get ready for the candidates, which will take place in Toronto in April of 2024. Third place was Andrei Esapenko, so he wins some cash, but unfortunately narrowly misses uh, the candidates. Um, And where that puts us in the, um, the open of the Candidate cycle is most of the spots are now determined. Um, Jan, Jan Napomnici, of course, is in as the person who lost to Ding Loren in the last World Championship. Pragananda uh, already earned a spot in the World Cup, as did Fabiano Caruana. Um, Vita is now in. Hakaru is now in. Carlson or Abasov uh, have FIDE World Cup spots. Uh, most people, of course, think that Carlson will not play in the FIDE uh, candidates, in which case Abasov would be his replacement. And that only leaves two other places. The top rating in January of 2024, which in all likelihood looks like it will now be Ali Reza Faruja. So he catches a bit of a break because uh, he had a decent showing in this tournament, but Hikaru was lined up to most likely get the rating spot. And now it will most likely be Ali Reza. Um, And the FIDE circuit, um, from my understanding, it's likely to be either Anish Giri or Gukesh, and I believe that Anish Giri is more likely to emerge. So the most likely candidates field um, in summation is Nepo, Prague, Caruana, Abasov, Vita, Hakaru, um, Giri, and Faruja. So nice mix of young upstarts and savvy veterans. Super excited for that. Um, in the women's section, the... Uh, Sorry, by ben, shop- can I interrupt yeah. for a moment? So yeah. I, I actually realized that maybe because we made some notes before the show, but actually it's I think the rating spot is a little bit open because uh, Firuzia is playing in the Sinclafield Cup now, and he has I think around ten rating points over Vesli Saw, and I think also Dominguez is somewhere like fourteen uh, rating points behind. So in theoretically, if Firuzia loses five points and Vesli wins five points, I think Vesli is in. So. Firuzia does have like a head start, but it's not unimaginable to see him lose it. So he needs to play well. So Sinkfield will kind of determine what will happen for the rating, I think. Ah, and what if he drops out of the tournament? Um, uh, I guess then then, uh, then, then Sol needs to win 10 rating points or something. There was oh. even a sen- scenario, I think, pointed out by Doji that if both Firuzia and Sol do terribly, that Karyakin, who is currently number nine in the world, might uh, get to the candidates, which would be, I think, a bit of a pity. And not very likely, but I think there is still a lot to play for. Uh, for oh, the rating okay. Points. Because what I had, what what made me, and I actually, my apologies, and thank you for the correction. I should have um, looked at that more closely because I watched an interview, one of the post game interviews with Ali Reza, with a couple rounds left, where he talked about having to play. He said, "You know, I'm hoping to win this so I don't have to play the Grand Swiss." Um, so I thought that, or not the Grand Swiss, uh, the Sinkfield Cup. So I thought that maybe uh, dropping out was on the table, but that would be if he had like a 20, 25 point lead, as you say, with a 10 point lead. 
Um, it's unclear, like from a game theoretical perspective, what the best thing to do is. But of course, as like a sports fan, you just want them to show up and play, you know, like uh, don't don't uh, don't dodge your opponents in order to get the seed, although certainly uh, wouldn't be unprecedented in the uh, in the uh, history of of chess. Um, so anything else to add before we quickly cover the women's and then enter into more discussion? No, that's all. I think Giri, I think he's more or less guaranteed the spot because Gukesh is not playing Sinkafield and Giri is. So it's very likely that, that his lead will even increase because he will get, a, because his weakest grand, grand uh, circuit uh, tournament is only two points and I think he needs to qualify better, do better than fifth place or something. Uh, something along those lines. So there is the big chance that he will get some more points while Gukas is not playing anything as far as I know. Okay. So preliminary congratulations to Anish Giri. Always root for him as well. Um, so in the women's section, of course, uh, Prakananda's sister, Vaishali Ramesh Babu, won the tournament in convincing, super impressive fashion. $25,000, a candidate spot. She's on the cusp of earning the Grandmaster title, but I believe she's still a rating point or two short. Does, did, are you, do you know about that, Vieco? I'm not sure. I'm okay, not. I think she needed to win her last game and she drew it. So, um, nice But point. she has the three norms and obviously it's inevitable that she's going to be a grandmaster um so amazing performance by her i always think of one of my interviews with grandmaster Jakob Agard where he raved about uh her chess um, talent and obviously it's uh coming to the fore now uh second place uh grandmaster anna muzichuk who of course already had a spot in the candidates but i'm sure she's happy to be in form and wins uh seventeen thousand five hundred dollars for her troubles and because uh, anna already had a spot the third place finisher tong tan zhong yi uh gets the second candidate spot so the um Entrance for the women's candidates, which will also be in Toronto uh, at the same time, are Alexandra Goryachkina, Humpy Kaneru, Lei Tenji, Katerina Lagno, Anna Mozichuk, Tan Zhang Yi, uh, Vaishali, and Nergyul Salamova. So uh, similar in theme where it's a lot of the sort of veteran stalwarts and a few upstarts both in both candidates' fields. So it, it should should be entertaining as well. Um, so, Vieco, I know you've been following this tournament super closely, nerding out on some of the um, opening novelties and stuff throughout the course of the tournament. Um, as a fan, when you follow a tournament like this, like how much of it is about seeing who gets the candidate spots and how much of it is just about seeing these competitors go head to head? I mean, I, I mean, I think both although i have to say that the fact that there is something so big on the line definitely makes the whole intrigue more interesting i mean in general i like following a lot of chess especially when there is like a, you know wider field and a lot of mismatches and maybe some players i i know personally or, or roots for or something along those lines but of course when there are two candidate spots it makes everything just because also the chess i think is much more interesting uh, in itself because people are are either affected by the nurse or or trying harder than maybe usual, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I wish that I've been trying to brainstorm ways that more tournaments could have this sort of super important stakes. The aforementioned Mr. Daji I discussed when we were previewing the uh, the FIDE World Cup. Um, there's something about that that it's just it's hard to replicate, uh, you know, like a lot of people probably are not NBA fans. But basically in, in the NBA right now, they're trying to do like an in-season tournament. Um, and the problem is these guys all have so much money um, that it's hard to get them to care about like a regular season game. And they're like trying to entice them by offering a little bit more money um, and trying to like sort of whip up interest in it. And there's some parallels to me in chess where these tournaments where the candidates spots are on the line. Clearly, everyone's all in. They take it super seriously. They bring out their best prep. Um, they take chances when they have to. But the other tournaments, it's not necessarily the case. And obviously, top perf top chess players are not like uh, compensated the way that um, the uh, NBA professionals are, but they still they still kind of pick their spots in, in a similar fashion. And I just wish that there were more tournaments that, that brought this level of uh, fascination. Yeah, I fully agree. I was talking about that with, with uh, my girlfriend, Mike, who was unfortunate enough to be near me when Grand Suisse was going on. <laughs> she, had, she had to endure all the reports in real life as much as she could. But we, I was like talking about, but 
yeah, maybe we should just have like, you know, in tennis style, four Grand Slams. Yeah. Okay, one can be World Cup style, so more knockout, the other can be open. And then from each quote unquote Grand Slam, two people qualify to the candidates. And then you don't even, because you can make an argument, oh, but it's a little bit random. But if you have, you know, if you're like a top player and in four tournaments, you don't qualify to the candidates and you could make an argument, but then you don't deserve to be in the candidates to begin with. So, and I know that some people will be like, oh, but then we, we can just go away with uh, with the World Championship and candidates and have only uh, Grand Slams. But, uh, I, and I also, I mean, that's just one idea. I'm not sure how viable it is because, you know, it's uh, probably a bit tricky for players to, especially if you have a knockout event to plan it out and everything but I, w- I would like to have more open type events and less closed events yeah i agree and i've also thought about the idea of some sort of uh grand slam type setup or like in golf they have the majors um because there is there there's something special when there's more on the line and of course uh you know the the format of the candidates gets uh sort of bandied about a lot of like qualifying for the candidates but this time i feel like it worked out pretty decently i mean if you look at the the live ratings list you've got magnus number one of course fabiano number two he's in naka number three he's in ding number four he obviously uh will is holding the title and we're glad glad to get an update on his health uh tarje swenson of chess.com Recently, I uh, got information from him about why he hasn't been playing. They didn't go into a lot of details, but he said it was health oriented and he hopes to be back soon. So best wishes to Ding. Nepo number five is in Ali Reza. And number six is in Anish. Number seven looks to be in. So then you have Wesley So at number eight. And as you said, um, so maybe he passes, as you say, he's 10 points behind Ali Reza. So one of them will get in. Um, and then you do have a couple upstarts in the form of uh, Prakananda and probably Abasov and Vita. So there's a few wild cards in there, but if the top five eligible rated players end up getting in out of the eight, to me, that's not a disaster. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, and I also it also shows that this argument that many people like to pull is oh but the open players do show the true strength and the 2650 players are as good as 27 to 50 players but no without uh, they don't get the opportunities i mean i get the argument that there is something to it but usually in, in especially now that pe- people have adjusted to world cup and open events um i think usually you see the top finishers are among the best players like we have had caruana we have had uh, Nakamura finished very, very high. Okay, maybe some others like Firuzia was not at peak and you could make an argument that Esipenko and Vidit are not the upper echelon. But in general, I think that uh, they are. it turns out that the rating is a good indicator of, of the strength and it's nice to, to get yeah, the absolutely strongest possible candidates uh, because I think it makes it the most interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And ratings might be deflating, but they're still they still on a relative basis seem to more or less accurately reflect uh, who the best players are. And yeah, I, I, despite the fact that they didn't end up winning, Caruana and Nakamura, I've been so impressed with their form lately in that it just feels like they're always there, you know, mm-hmm. and Fabiano got back above 2800. I think he slipped a little below uh, uh, at the end of the tournament, but it's nice to see him in form. And I'm sure a little later we'll uh, do a preliminary evaluation of uh, what might happen in the candidates. But but first, let's talk about the tournament a bit more. So I know, Vieco, uh, as you said, your girlfriend, Micah Keatman, who was on the pod recently um, of, of Chessable, uh, indulged you and <laughs> sat around as you watched a lot of chess, and I'm sure watched some herself. Um, so was there anyone's play that stood out to you? I know you watched a lot of post-game interviews. Was there anyone's personality that stood out to you? Like, what what else grabbed you about this tournament? Oof. I mean, there were so many good stories. Uh, it's it's hard to hard to begin. I, I'm not sure where to begin. But, um, I mean, obviously, the, the play of the winners was very impressive. Like, Nakamura, I think, is... I, I don't know how he does it. He, he started super slow or somewhat slow, but then he accelerated. We did it uh, losing the first round in absolute to deva setting style grotesque yeah <laughs> yeah like in one move on, on move control and then he bounces back that was also very impressive i mean there were many many players like i don't know was also amazing kamer uh i don't know sindarov also i think he broke 2700 and prompted some people to that he will be 2750 but uh yeah it, I, it's hard to single out one uh, if i have to like pinpoint one interview i think uh one that's very much worth watching is Deaz Bogdan Daniel. 
it's interview after after one of the rounds. I think I also linked it on Twitter because it's really entertaining. It's kind of like a in the Ivanchuk style, a little bit you know dry, but but very entertaining. And and from the more um, like uh, let's say longer form interview, I definitely enjoyed. Um, first of all, I enjoyed Abhamanius Mishra analysis of his. Um, a win over Ivanchuk, I think it was 11th round because he demonstrated some scary good calculations, like, like absolutely insane calculations. Like I know that people have said he's a great calculator, but it, this shows how good he really is. Like it's basically him 10, 10 uh, minutes st- spewing some lines that are very, very deep and very precise. So it's, it's very impressive. Yeah, there were also, I don't know, I mean, that that's all just from the top of my head. Really. Yeah, that's already a lot yeah. of homework. So, yeah. so, uh, I, so. I, I also, maybe maybe one that's very nice to pinpoint is Sevian's interview after he beat Firuzia, because he also analyzed the game. And, you know, he's usually a little bit like on the serious side. I don't think I have ever seen him so aesthetic and happy. He was like very, very, very brimming uh, after the game. And it's nice to see that, uh, you know... Even at that level, wins over stronger opponents can can you know have that effect on people. It was really heartwarming and also very impressive game. Yeah, for sure. I enjoyed a couple of interviews with uh, Grandmaster Sam Sevian as well. And also one more person to mention had a, a great showing. Um, Grandmaster Max Hudalu up to number thirteen in the world on the live rankings um, at age twenty three. Yeah, um, it, it's also very funny because I think in one of the last interviews, maybe it's even after the last round, we after his game with Eric Gaisi, so Nakamura, they asked him about some positions, and then I think Max would, no, that was the 10th round, actually, when Max would lost, lost to, I think, to Esipenko. Or so, uh, yeah, one of the Nakamura interviews where he drew quickly, then they asked him to comment on Max Hudwo game, and he said, "Oh yeah, that's a typical Max Hudwo position. <laughs> like it, <laughs> it's very dubious, but he 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 got to where he is by uh, by b- winning those kinds of positions against 2600, 2650 players. So I'm not sure if that was like a praise or or a little bit of skepticism whether he has <laughs> that strength. But uh, it was a re- because when you look at his games, like it's always like some king somewhere in the middle, some imbalance and some crazy stuff. So it's it's very entertaining." Yeah, fun fun to watch for sure. Yeah, and just to say a little bit more about what, what Vidit did, I mean, to me, there's a lot that club players can take from that. I mean, Vieco mentioned he blundered in the first game, but it's hard to... It's hard to exaggerate the scale of the blunder. Like you really have to to look at this game. So he's playing Grandmaster Erwin Lemie with the black pieces. Um, he had time management issues throughout the tournament, um, but he actually said in a post tournament interview with Grandmaster Alex Trolovich, he said that part of the reason he felt like he broke through is he just played better in time trouble uh, this time around than other times. But it was funny to hear him say that because in the first game he did not play better. You know, move thirty seven. He he has a significant advantage in a rook end game, rook and minor piece end game, and it looks like he's just cruising. Uh, first, the advantage goes away, and then, as Vieco said, on move forty, he blunders to like he blunders like very basic. I think it was to a knight fork, um, just losing a rook. So to come back from that and win the tournament is just, I mean, of course, there's this famous idea called the Swiss Gambit, where if you're playing like a large open tournament, if you lose early, you get easier pairings and it's easier to make up ground. But that's not the case in this tournament. I mean, the whole field is an absolute monster. So it's not like you get significant. I mean, you might avoid knock on Caruana for a couple rounds. But other than that, I mean, it, you just beat Grandmaster after Grandmaster. So just an, an incredible showing. And, you know, 29 makes him a veteran in the chess world. So to see him have this breakthrough something he's wanted for a long time i'm super excited to see how how it goes in the candidates yeah it will be definitely interesting because he was always very well prepared and i think in candidates he will bring his a game for sure and also it will be interesting to see how the quote-unquote indian camp will divide between him and prague because i guess they usually work a lot a lot together in the indian team right yeah that's a good point and do you so who would you say is assuming that it's what looks to be the most likely lineup in the candidates? As you say, it's not uh, cast in stone that it's Feruja, but assume that it's Feruja, Abasov, and the other people who already have the spots, including Geary. Who would you uh, rank as the favorite in the 2024 candidates, Fierko? Oh, I mean, I don't think there's a favorite favorite. Like, there's maybe somebody whom you could give like. I don't know, maybe 20 or something along the 20% chance of win. But I mean, given the recent form, 
you could pick probably Caruana or Nakamura and and not be wrong. I guess that would be as as legitimate guess as any any of them. But you know, Nepo has won two times in a row. Um, yeah. I frankly don't see. I don't think anybody apart from those three could do it. Uh, honestly, I, if I would had my money, I would put it either on Fabio or on Nepo. But you never know what can happen. And somebody po- pointed out that now with Ding kind of maybe out of the picture and Carlson not interested, this might be like a very big shot to Mac- for Nakamura to actually get into involved and capture the crown. So he might be very motivated despite... I think I saw also one interview where he was like, yeah, yeah, I don't care about candidates. For me, this is just one another tournament, uh, you know, because there's no pressure on me and so on. But uh, I'm not sure if he, if for a championship, he might literally care. Yeah, he literally <laughs> might. I, I, I think I would venture that he probably would. I mean, he's definitely, I mean, he's clearly professionally ambitious. Whether that professional ambition is like more targeted on his Twitch following and sort of raising his Q rating or whatever you want to call it um, versus um, maximizing his chess uh, um, results. That part's a little hard to dissect, but he's not wasting his time. Whatever he's doing, he's trying to like, um, you know, increase his his visibility and his earning power. And to my mind, uh, him being world champion would have an excellent ROI in that department. So I suspect he'll be working hard. And yeah, obviously not to be discounted. I agree with you that, I mean, I still, I, I it's, you know, one discounts Nepo at his peril, his or her peril, but I, I would put Naka and Caruana as the two most likely Nepo below that. And the dark horse, just because he's so young and dangerous, I, I wouldn't discount Prague entirely, but, um, but it's tough for the, it's tough in that, you know, double round robin format. Uh, it's tough for massive upsets to take place. Yeah, I don't see Prague doing it, but okay. I, you know, <laughs> you can maybe clip that and then you know rub it in my nose <laughs> yeah, right. in, in like about five six months whenever the candidates. I think in April, right? So yeah, yeah. I might be wrong about that. Yeah, and yeah. then. So the the women's section, Vieco also had great threads on a lot of fascinating games from that. Obviously, of course, the the biggest story is uh, soon to be Grandmaster Vaishali's amazing performance. Did did anything else uh, jump out to you from from the women's section, Vieco? Yeah, definitely. Because um, first of all, uh, you know, it was something under the radar, but actually, Pia Kramling, you know, the legendary Grandmaster and and uh, mother of. Uh, popular another popular streamer Anna Kramling she was actually very close to qualifying herself so she was had also a slower start but I think uh, at the end she she was at six and a half out of ten and maybe if she won her final game with white and some other results coincided she might have been in for sure uh, then also there is the four I think she's a former world champion right Stefano Antoinetta yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I should ask uh, Navara, but uh, I think I think she <laughs> I think she is. So she was also, you know, because she's a little bit past her prime, I would say. I, I don't think she was that much into the spotlight recently, but she's played a very good tournament. Also came very very close to qualifying. Uh, had some very interesting games. Like I liked her non-conventional openings with Black. Like she played Schwimmer and Rui Lopez in one game and so on. So very 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 good performance by her, I thought, and very interesting games. And of course, there's Tan Zhongqi, because I, uh, half of the tournament, I was under the impression that Tan is already in the candidates. But then uh, after the last round, when I saw her on the Wikipedia for the candidates, that she qualified from Grand Suisse, I realized, wait, but she played the candidates final against Wei Ting Jie. And that was the situation where that final was at the same time as female, female Grand Prix. So she couldn't play the FIDA Grand Prix or qualify from there. So this was one of her rare chances. And sh- if she didn't do it now, she she wouldn't get the rating spot because I think it will go to Humphrey Conner if, if nothing changes. So, yeah, and she had to win in the last round on demand and she did it. And it was also a topsy-turvy game and she blundered like an entire game at some po- m- moment. So, yeah, those four were definitely, definitely like positive side. Although there were also some young ones, uh, this... Uh, What's what's this? Uh, n- the name of this opponent who played by Shawi in the last round? I, I can't pronounce it. Mungun Mungun too. Or yeah, she had quite a tournament. Yeah, yeah. And also there were some sadder stories. For example, Alice Lee. She had a disastrous tournament. Uh, I mean, she's very young still. 
Uh, I was following her game with interest because, you know, she's actually a superstar and, and already and, and, you know, uh, always interesting to follow. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a bit tough. I guess also the fact that it was just a couple of days after the US championship for her maybe didn't help. And uh, But yeah, so there were definitely some losers uh, in both sections though, but somehow in the women's section, I kind of kept track of, because there was also less boards, so it was easier. But yeah, in my summary, <laughs> I don't know if you have any any other uh, spotlight. No, that that about covers it. And what about um any interviews that stood out to you from the the woman participants? Oh, I definitely liked uh, Vaishavi. I I mean I watched Vaishavi the most for sure. Uh, I think there was one interview after her third round game against Gary Fulina. Where she she it, she played like a towel like game where she sacrificed everything. Oh yeah, that game was crazy. Yeah, there was some bishop e six, and then it wasn't fully yeah. the opening wasn't too impressive, but then she sacrificed everything and showcased her talent. And yeah, she was I think I saw that on the chess base India channel, uh, and uh, yeah, she was just also in the same style as Sevian, like brimming with excitement, brimming with joy for the game, uh, you know, being super excited, super you know, with big smile on the entire the entire time. And then Sagar was asking her, "Oh, but did you like learn to be too creative because some of the sacrifices were maybe not necessary or not fully correct?" But she was like, "Yeah, maybe not, but I couldn't resist playing it." So it was very, very you know, uh, heartwarming to see some but enjoying, enjoying the game so much. And also, um, Pia Kramling's interview where she constantly emphasizes how much she loves the game, those were the ones that stood out to me. Although I'm sure there are many, many more because a yeah, shout out to Fiona Stel Anthony. I keep being impressed by her interviewing skills and, and I, the, the, all the interviews on the FIDE website or FIDE YouTube channel, but also on Chess with India channel are, are very, very worth watching. Okay, so we'll round up a bunch and link to them. Yeah, and I agree that uh, Fiona does a fantastic job. And to to what you mentioned about Pia Grambling, that would have been a lot of fun to have, like true true OG in the women's candidates. That would have been uh, amazing. But um, it should be entertaining, nonetheless. So Goryachkina, Hapi Kaneru, Lei Tengji, Katarina Lagno, Anna Muzichuk. Tanjong Yi, Vaishali, and Salamova. Um, my first thought is that this one is more um, open than the open <laughs> than the men's uh, section. Like uh, I almost feel like anyone can win. Do you do you agree, Vierko? Yeah, m m definitely, definitely more open. Um, I mean, okay, if you had to be a bookie, maybe you you wouldn't put too much money on the lowest seats, Salimova, although. Yeah, there's definitely the, the rating differences are they're actually not lower be, between the highest and the and the lowest seed. But yeah, uh, but I think it's a pretty open. Uh, a couple of years ago, one would say Goryachki now without a doubt, she seemed to really be breaking through to 2600. But um, lately, she wasn't so dominant, so it's pretty open, I think. And depending who comes in best form, I think we'll have the best chance, of course. Yeah. yeah, it still feels like she has kind of the highest ceiling, but yeah, because she hasn't been in form, it it feels like it could be a pretty pretty closely contested. Um, yeah, excellent. Wei Tingjie is also yeah very was very impressive. Wei Tui losing it narrowly, I wouldn't yeah bet against her for sure. I mean, of course, Konero Wagner very strong. Uh, yeah, Tang Zhengji also not to be underestimated. Vaishali, you never know what she might do and how much she might grow even further. So it will be very interesting to follow too. And it's kind of nice that there will be held at the same time at the same place for the first time. Yeah. Although as, as uh, Mr. Daji said, when we were discussing the World Cup, like when it's concurrent, sometimes it feels like maybe the, the open slash men's section, um, it can suck up all the oxygen, you know? So, um, uh, you know, obviously this is one of the many things where it's easy to like ask for something that's more and costs more, you know, and just like pretend like it's just going to appear out of thin air. But I would love if it were all in April, all at the same venue in Toronto, but uh, in 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 uh, succession rather than concurrent um, <laughs> with the, uh, the women and men's events. Yeah, that's definitely a, a fair point. And uh, yeah, I definitely noticed that also when writing these threads on Twitter that, yeah, unfortunately, there is much more traction in the open one when, than on the female one. Although I, I think that, you know, uh, that shouldn't be the, met, uh, the only metric to prevent 
let's say me as a content creator to do this because I think it's important to you know bring more limelight despite the less engagement in, and then maybe you know hoping that one day it, it will it will increase if not uh, equalize with with the open section. So yeah, maybe yeah, and- maybe there's an argument that with all the you know that some people who maybe wouldn't follow the female uh, tournament will follow it because it's at the same time and then it's convenient, you know, like, or, the, or, or there is a big broadcast and then they switch to the female games that also gives them some, some more limelight. I, I'm not sure what, whether the numbers are true and, or not, and, and that, you, that could be debated, but I could see both sides personally. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, and yeah, maybe if, if, it's, if my hypothesis that it's a more open field is true, maybe if something unpredictable happens, that will generate some, uh, some interest as well. Although really the only like headline generating thing, I mean, so many of the women in the, um, in the candidates have been there before, you know, it's really, uh, Vaishali would be the one that would be big news if she broke through in my, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Or so emo, yes. Yeah. yeah, but as you said, un- unfortunately, that's probably not, doesn't seem as likely, although you never know. Um, all right, well, Vieco, this has been great. Really appreciate you having your finger on the pulse. Uh, listeners, I know that uh, uh, Twitter slash X is uh, dying social media, you know, may- maybe for the best. But even if you're not on Twitter, you can uh, check out Chess Central's Twitter and just uh like Google his page and I'll link to his page and you can see all the threads he do, he did highlighting some of the uh, best games and interviews. So um, Vieco, I know you got a chessable course to get back to work on as well as social plans. Um, anything to add before we say goodbye? No, no, not. This has been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, uh, I I feel feel we have barely scratched the surface. Uh, so yeah, you, if you you guys are <laughs> expecting a thirty minute summary of of a eleven round event, uh, yeah, it, it it will always be like that. So I would urge you to follow it more closely <laughs> in the future. And yeah, let's grow the game. Or how 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 do they say it these days? Yeah, exactly. And 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 as you alluded to, Chess Space India's coverage is great. So it's, it's amazing that Sagar is always there. You know. And uh, and of course the Fide channel, so many fun interviews with uh, Fiona and Grandmaster Alex Trolovich. So, uh, listeners are not lacking for content on this event that they can still uh, get value from even after it's over. Yeah, um, but on that note, yeah. we should say goodbye. So, uh, Vieco, any clo- if you have any closing thoughts, uh, have Adam. But otherwise, uh, thank thanks again for coming on. And no, nothing particular. Thanks for inviting me. It's always an uh, honor and pleasure. And we are here to catch up with a friend of a pod representing an institution, which I hope is also a friend of a pod. I am certainly a fan of LeeChess.org. I think most of you know LeeChess is a community-supported, free, open-source, add-and-tracker-free chess site, which plays host to over 5 million chess games per day. It's the second most popular chess site in the world, and they always have a lot going on behind the scenes, always working to improve their product, as any institution should. So we are excited to catch up with their community manager, Chris Callahan. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you for having me. Uh, with with the power vested in me by Lee Chess, I hereby officially declare you a friend of Lee Chess. Excellent. That is... uh, congratulations. Okay. You that makes discounts. That makes my day because Lee Chess is so beloved in the chess community, obviously, for providing free chess forever, as they always say. So, Chris, your day to day work, as we discussed in our prior interview in 2021, kind of runs the gamut in terms of responsibilities. Um, But what's going on at the top level of Lee Chess? What are the big discussions about right now? Oh, there are quite a few. Well, that's probably the biggest difference is that there isn't one discussion anymore. Like I, I can remember in the olden days, you know, it would just, you kind of, it was like a, Lee Chess was like a small town. There was only a few people doing anything at all for Lee Chess and everybody knew each other and everybody pitched in and everywhere. And it's kind of not like that anymore. The team has gotten so big that now, you, you know, people that are working in content might not know somebody that's working in moderation or somebody in moderation might not know somebody that's working on the dev side of things because there's just too many people you can't be you know close friends with more than 100 people or something like that uh it's it's just been growing and growing and the the world of chess in general has been growing alongside it as well excellent so how many employees are you guys these days so the total team is over 100 people and it's a very very difficult thing to count every time i do one of these podcasts i know that question is coming so i try to get a concrete answer and it's just not Possible. There's more than 100 people on the team, but only about 10 of them are paid employees um, because we rely very, very, very heavily on 
volunteer work. Volunteer work at Leech Us is not a supplement. It just is how the website exists. We, we wouldn't exist without volunteers. The big majority of, I guess we'll say, man hours uh, invested into Lee Chess are by people who are not being paid for it. So, uh, you know, not only does Lee Chess exist for the community, it's it's made by the community. Like we, we, we need that sort of uh, buy-in from the community in order to be able to, to, to do anything. And it sounds like things are going pretty well. I mean, so you mentioned that the team is even bigger than last time we spoke. And of course, we spoke at a unique time in 2021 coming off of the sort of, as you described it, uh, twin booms of the um, pandemic boom and the Queen's Gambit boom. So Lee Chess has seen growth even after that? Yeah, you can. Uh, we, we have a public database of all rated games and you can kind of see the the growth and the plateauing and the second boom and the, the whole story of it in that database. Because uh, if you go to the, the webpage or you download it, you'll see the number of games and it's the total number of games as well into the billions now. And you can see, you know, the, the number of games doubles in a month or two when the pandemic happens and it shoots up again when Queen's Gambit happens and then it plateaus a bit and drops down a bit and then it goes back up. And yeah, yeah, everything's just, just growing and growing in general, I think for everybody in chess. Okay, yeah, I'm well familiar with that database. It's an excellent service that you can download all the games. Of course, the thing is massive, and I'm actually using amateur games for the chessable course I'm working on, so I had to engage friend of the pod, Todd Bryant, to figure out how to get, like, it's all well and good that it says there's 100 million games there, but how do we get, like, you know, a tech potser like me to actually be able to download and access those games? But uh, shout out to Todd. He made it happen, and I, you know, I saw that growth going from 4 million games a month to 100 million in recent months. It's uh, absolutely insane to see, and it's glad to. I'm glad to hear that that sort of filters through. It's not just more people are playing. You're actually getting more more contributions and able to hire and uh, solicit more volunteers based on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but you still didn't answer my question, Chris, of what the top level meetings are about. I mean, I get that there's more than one topics, but oh, or, oh I can tell. So I can tell you, uh, th there's. I can certainly tell you what the content people are talking about. I'm I'm sort of on the content or community side of things. Okay. So that includes uh, social media. That includes the live event broadcasts. So somebody has to set those up. That includes blogs. <laughs> that includes the YouTube channel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just to pick one conversation, we're talking a lot about blogs right now so on leeches anyone can write a blog there, there are no limitations as far as you need our permission to write a blog anybody can, if you have a functioning leeches account you can go write a blog right now and those blogs are fed into a system which is not quite as democratic there's an algorithm like there are on many websites that push push certain things to the top and other things can be sort of not not discovered and, and the community won't find it and there is a lot of discussion about how to make that algorithm and how to make how we present blogs in general, not only fair, but just sort of serve our users. You know, so for example, if you look on the homepage right now, you will see three blogs and those blogs get those, the, we should say those spots get tons of traffic because the homepage gets an order of magnitude more traffic than the blog page. So if stuff's on the homepage, it, it, it gets seen, it gets lots of views. And it used to be that those two, there's an official Lee Chess blog and then there's two blogs from users. It used to be that those two blogs were the two top spots. So if you go to the you know blog page and stuff is ranked by how many people liked it and et cetera, the top two spots would get those spots on the homepage. And if you, the highest you could get your blog to was number three, you were just out of luck. You were just not going to get access to the, to, to the fire hose of views that comes from the homepage. So we switched that up to be a little bit more egalitarian and now it uh, shuffles among the top six. So it, it isn't quite so feast or famine, but I don't, I don't think that it's, you know, finished by any means. It's uh, we want, we want people to be able to find the established bloggers when they release a new blog, but we also want new bloggers to be able to start blogging and if their stuff is good enough and they get, you know, people like it, it should be able to climb up to the top on its own merit. But arranging something like that into a specific, you know, mathematical formula in the code can, can be difficult. Yeah. 
And you're right. I mean, as someone who blogs about once every six months, I can I can verify that they they do get thousands and thousands of views. Um, I know a friend friend of the fellow friend of the pod, Nate Solon, is always uh, getting tons of traffic through Lee Chess. So it's it's a great service. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a big, like I think Nate qualifies as a big blogger on, on the Lee Chess page. You build the following and you get lots of likes and you sort of every blog you release kind of automatically goes towards the tops on the, on the power of that, just on the, on the momentum of all of that. And it can be really hard for new bloggers to get their foot in the door. Right. And at the same time, a lot of the new bloggers don't deserve to get their foot right. in the door. There's a lot of like low effort sort of, you know, three sentence because we let absolutely anybody write a blog. Right. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're trying to handle that situation as best we can now. Yeah. And I know I saw some Q&A somewhere that you did where like you were talking about the fact that a lot of blogs are for better, or for worse, sort of sponsored content. And, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm not <laughs> absolved of this either. Like if I write a blog post, it's often promoting an episode that I did, which is not like, you know, it's certainly downstream of monetization. It's not, it's not unmonetized, put it like that. Um, so I, you know, I certainly understand sort of both sides of the dilemma where you guys are a free, um, donation driven ad free site, but then a lot of people like blogging can be pretty, um, you know, pretty thankless to, for a lot of people. So if they do, it's often going to be to promote something. So where have you guys landed on like sort of how to treat that issue? This is another thing that is hotly discussed, both with blogs, with streamers, with social media, just sort of how do we find the balance between, you know, helping the community and and sort of staying true to our principles. One of the things we want to help the community with is making a living. Right. I'm super happy when somebody, you know, is a streamer and they can make a living from it and and we, you know, link them on the homepage and we help them out with it. That makes me very happy. I'm very happy when somebody is, you know, writing blogs and they have a Patreon and they have their loyal viewers who, you know, pay to help them spend more time blogging. At the same time, like you said, it, it would be very easy for the blogs to just become, you know, pure advertising. You could pay somebody, uh, some some company could pay somebody to just write a blog that's pure ad copy, which which we don't want. So generally, the, the, the principle is, is that we want a blog or a stream or whatever to provide some value to the user that isn't, you know, just an ad or only an ad. And mo- most of our bloggers do pretty well with that. And most of our streamers do pretty well with that. But it, it's just it's a difficult thing to communicate because you want to, you know, you want to tell the bloggers and the streamers and everyone you want to give them clear lines that they can't cross and it's kind of hard to communicate. You, you just give them these sort of vague, nebulous ideas like don't push it too far. If you write a real blog and there's this long, interesting blog with chess analysis and all sorts of good, and then at the end you say, here's my Patreon, you know, perfect. That's what we want. Uh, and if it's a pure ad for something that you're selling and there's really nothing other than like trying to sell, that's what we don't want. And where it falls in between, I don't know. We, we, we just have to trust people to figure it out and communicate to them when we think they fall short. I'm taking careful notes here because I'm going to do a a thinly veiled (laughs) promo for my book soon. So, (laughs) (laughs) Um, all right. And Chris, so obviously you, as you said, you're on the content side, but, um, but I'm sure you have some uh, knowledge of like what the programmers are working on. Is there any sort of major project in the works that you're like at Liberty to discuss at this stage? Um, I don't think there's, well, there's no like super new feature. We're, we're integrating um, Stockfish 16 into the online site right now, which is a lot more complicated than you might think because um, the Stockfish that you, that you have on your computer is not always exactly the same as the one that, you know, fits in a browser. Sometimes there are some issues sort of getting it onto the website. So the devs are working on that. And I'll be honest, the, the exact details are a little over my head. Um, but yeah, we, we probably have a lot less sort of feature announcements than other websites. And by the way, when I say other websites, I'm not necessarily saying chess.com. I mean other websites of any sort. Um, because there isn't the big push from like the investors or the C-suites to like have something new. Right. The devs basically work on what they want to work on. 
and they decide like where the resources are spent and where their time is spent. And very often they would prefer to make sure the old stuff is still working instead of adding a new feature that they will have to, you know, spend time maintaining in the future. And there's no like, there's no boss who's going to send down the order like we need this variant or we need this feature, you know, have it on my desk in the morning. That makes sense. But having said that, does anything come to mind if I ask you, like, what is the most requested feature that, that Lee Chess doesn't currently offer? Oh, yeah, we get we get requested all the time. Uh, Bug House is a big request. Right. Uh, brilliant Moves, Chess.com style pro Brilliant Moves is a very popular request. Um, we get constant streams of new variants, and it's not all one variant. People write these emails and they describe the variant. They say, okay, uh, white goes twice in a row, and the bishop moves like a rook. And if you step on this square, this happens. And uh, well, those are, those ones are probably not getting implemented um, because it's it's it add, variants especially add a lot of complexity to the website. Whenever you add a new feature to any website or to any software, I guess you're sort of making your job as a dev harder going forward because there's a new. Uh, there's a new thing that needs to be taken care of. It's like if you put a fifth wheel on your car. Right. Now you need to get a fifth brake pad. You need to get a fifth tire. You need to connect it to the old systems. So not only is it work to put the fifth tire on, this is a very strange metaphor, but I'm going <laughs> to see it through to the end. Not only is it work to actually install the fifth tire, but it adds work going forward forever as long as you have the car. So as a veteran of requesting features, because over the years I have requested plenty of features to the devs, I know how those conversations go, and they're not going to, when you ask for something, it's not going to be easy. They're not going to say, sure, you know, we'll do it tomorrow. They're going to say, how important is this? How many people are asking for it? Et cetera, et cetera, you know, before it, it, uh, before it goes up on the website. Gotcha. And bringing it back to the financial side, Chris, so as we discussed in episode 221, our 2021 interview, um, Leachess is all about transparency. They make their costs public, available on a spreadsheet. I hadn't looked at it since our last interview, but I took another look at it today before uh, we chatted. And, you know, it's generally, I obviously appreciate the transparency. It's really cool to see, but there are some things that still, at least to me, I, I don't completely understand. Like, so one question I had is, are you guys generating a surplus at this point? Or like, is there excess revenue that comes in or is just everything put back into the organization? There is excess revenue. Like we, we have, you know, bank accounts with um, enough money for a decent, like if we stop getting donations tomorrow, somehow we would, the lights would not be out the next day. We would, we have some runway there where we have some money saved up. Um, all of that, by the way, is also publicly available data. We just don't have it on the website. We would, a long-term plan of ours to get that information as far as like, you know, w what's in our bank accounts and what our revenue is and just the things that aren't in cost. It's actually pretty easy for us to agree to do that because legally in France you have to. We, the, um, the cost spreadsheet is sort of that that is on the website, which is leechess.org/cost, is sort of our estimates on what we're spending. But it doesn't always work out precisely that way, you know. Like there's a content budget, but and it's a flat number. But you know, on, on a month where there's a big chess tournament, we're going to spend more than on a month where nothing happens. Uh, in addition to that, we have to file sort of itemized breakdowns of everything we spend money on with the French government. And you can find that information if you search it on the French you know, government website. Um, we would love to put it on, the, the, on Leachess, but the, the government form is not especially readable. So we would prefer to have it something like the cost spreadsheets, where it's actually just the information people are looking for in sort of neat rows. Um, but yeah, we, we try to be as transparent as we can be. Like, I feel like when people donate money to us, you know, we have some responsibility to, to show what we're doing with it as specifically as we can. That's great. And is there any truth to the rumor that uh, Thibaut put all of your savings, all of Lee Chess's savings into CryptoKitties? Yes, yes. But fortunately, the CryptoKitties shot up in value. <laughs> oh, okay. So I give Thibaut full, full credit for... Uh, having the vision to invest our money wisely. Okay, glad to hear it. Glad to hear that he is a savvy NFT <laughs> investor. Um, and let me, so we have a Patreon mailbag question. This one is from Michael Spisner, who uh, for context is a retired lawyer who has been offering 
to help leech us um, become a 5013C in in the US, which could be a boon to their donations, as I'm sure you guys are aware, although it's not an easy process. So he's wondering uh, what the state of those efforts are. Um, it's not entirely my department, but I am aware that those efforts are moving forward. It is quite complicated to take out a 501c3. It's not sort of like you fill out one form and you're done. You have to have a separate organization, you know, on paper formed in the United States. It has to have board members. There is also lots of paperwork. And in general, I think it, it will happen eventually. Um, but the whole thing is kind of nebulous in the sense that the, so if you have 501c3, the benefit for Lee Chess would be, uh, A, there are certain services that you, that there are certain services and discounts and et cetera. You get a better rate on PayPal that are given to 501c3 charities. Some of those will come to the French charity as well, but not all. The other big thing is that donors would be tax deductible, but it's only, I'm, I, and I'm not an accountant, so, uh, you know, maybe somebody listening is a tax account, they're going to get upset with me. My understanding is that that tax deductibility only counts if you're deducting a lot. Like the average person probably does, takes the standard deduction and they don't get that. So most Lee Chess donations are quite small. The average donation is about two euros. So, you know, we don't rely on these big donors that give big amounts. And it's unclear how much 501c3 would affect that. But that said, I think in the end, we're eventually going to have 501c3. Okay, good. And I know Michael's willing to help if needed. And and yeah, looking at that spreadsheet, Chris, if I read it correctly, so for, for every $5 in donations you get via PayPal, 39 cents goes to PayPal. Is that is that That's, right? That sounds about right. And that is better than uh, what other people using PayPal get. Yeah, that's <laughs> no <why> joke. <laughs> that adds up yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, it, I would love to, you know, take the money directly, but unfortunately, the payment platform is kind of something we have to contract out. <laughs> yeah. Until we, until we uh, found Lee Bank, which should be happening <laughs> any day now. Yeah, with with the Crypto Kitties money. Sure. <laughs> Um, and we got a couple other topics to catch up on, Chris. Number one, I feel like this has been a hot tub, hot button issue from the chess.com realm, but Lee Chess somehow stays above the fray as far as I can tell. But of course, cheating in chess, like anything new going on with cheat detection. And why do you think it is that like in all this stuff with like Vladimir Kramnik complaining about, you know, 97 percent i'm exaggerating of players cheating in in uh titled tuesday or whatever it may be like why do you think lee chess doesn't get mentioned as often i don't know i maybe we're just maybe we're just lucky i don't know if it's anything <laughs> intentional on our part um oh boy where to start cheating yeah there's always new developments and there's always new tools that the lee chess moderators are, are coming up with i'm very proud of the moderation team because you know, like I said before, uh, there are paid Lee Chess moderators that are that you know get a monthly uh, payment or, or whatever to do their job. But the big majority are volunteers, and they're just people who care deeply about the online chess community, and they want to keep it safe, and they want to keep the cheating out as much as they can, and they work really hard to do that. And we have people with you know advanced degrees. We have people with statistics degrees. Uh, we have at least uh, one grandmaster and uh, probably a few of the lower titles as well. And yeah, as far as, you know, Kramnik, I, I, it, when, when, when people guess at a certain percentage, this percentage of people are cheating or that percentage of people, it all sounds so vague to me. Does that mean they're cheating in every game? Does that mean they have cheated once right. in their lifetime? Have they cheated once this year? Like, can we be a little bit more specific with these numbers? And you know, it, it, there there is this um, there's this phenomenon that I when I was doing a little bit more moderation work that I saw, and it t seems to be a typical sort of cycle that certain people in the chess community go through of cheat paranoia to cheating. It's sort of the cheat paranoia to to cheating yourself pipeline because you see these accounts where people start to report other players, and it's not really a good 
report. Like the person clearly isn't cheating. And they report more and more and they get more and more angry. And they're saying, what, Leech us, why aren't you doing anything about this? And, you know, half of everybody I play is cheating. Three fourths of everyone I play is cheating. Everyone I'm playing is cheating. And then very often that person will cheat themselves. And then when they get banned, they write their last angry letter to Lee Chess that says, you don't do anything about cheating, but you ban me. You know, what, what is, what's going on there? Everyone else can cheat, but I'm not allowed to. Right. And they never stop to consider that there, there's a much simpler explanation for what they experienced. There's, you know? Yeah, that's like a Greek tragedy you just described. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad to, sad to hear. Um, but, but yeah, I mean... Obviously, very frustrating problem, as as we talked about last time. I mean, um, I guess, uh, do you think that because, I mean, obviously, you guys do have cash prizes in some of your arenas and stuff like that, but maybe not as big a profit motive as some of the chess.com stuff. Would you guess that there are fewer cheaters on Lee Chess, or do you think it, people are just going to cheat either way? Uh, it, it, would be, it would be such a stab in the dark that okay. I, I wouldn't even go in for it. But let me tell you, it doesn't. You don't need a gigantic prize to to have people cheat. You don't need any prize for people to cheat. Right. People will cheat for their own pride, you know. And it's it, it's really if I have anything to contribute, I want people th- that I don't think has been part of the the discourse. I want people to remember how badly we need to avoid false positives, and I don't see that coming up a lot. I, I have seen people say, you know, oh, it's 99% that he's cheating. Why doesn't he get banned? If we banned with 99% surety, and there's 5 million games a day played on Lee Chess, you can do the math to see how many, like, innocent people would be getting banned. And this has real consequences. You know, people, uh, when it becomes known in the community that you've been banned, you carry around that scarlet letter forever. And so for the moderators, it's our responsibility to take that seriously, that we don't ban people unless we're really sure, more than 99% sure, okay? And, you know, it's very easy to sort of sit on the sidelines and say, oh, they're clearly cheating, ban them. But if you're actually the person hitting the button and you know that this is going to affect their life, and, you know, uh, especially if it's, some, if it's some famous GM and, you're, you know, you're hitting the button, it, it can be very difficult to do, and you're not going to do it unless you think the evidence is overwhelming, unless you think that there's just no, there's no way around it. There's no you know, possibility that this person is innocent. And I hope people will remember as they discuss cheating, the like, emotional burden that we chess moderators and chess.com moderators and everybody else that's connected to it has to face as you know, they deal with that problem. Yeah. So it makes it all the more frustrating that it just keeps happening. But I guess you, you can only change human nature to to some extent. Um, but certainly appreciate all the volunteers at Lee Chess and all the employees, as you say, at chess.com uh, working to clean up the online streets. Um, so, Chris, another topic, uh, another sort of downer of a topic, although Lee Chess sort of uh, put a positive spin, spin on it, I guess you could say, or at least help, hopefully help to move the ball forward is um, you guys wrote and uh, took action in light of all the recent uh, sexual harassment stuff that's been going on, the allegations involving Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez, and you guys had some original reporting uh, involving allegations against Grandmaster Timur Gureyev. Um, and you discussed this at length in Oh No, Another Chess Podcast. So listeners, if, if they want to hear more about it, I would definitely direct them to that. But um, I did have a couple. First of all, people should hear a bit about it here. But also, I had a few questions of my own, one of which was like, um, so you, so Lee Chess published an article called Breaking the Silence, in which they went through all of these allegations and, and also announced that they would no longer be partnering with the St. Louis Chess Club and with U.S. Chess based on the way that they handled these allegations. And one thing that came up in your interview with Ono, Chris, is that uh, you guys were discussing it as if you had written the article. But if memory serves, when the article was written, it was credited, it was, the byline was Lee Chess. Um, so uh, could you explain that a little bit? Was it your writing or a team or what? I mean, I get maybe you could call me the primary author or something. And it, it was not 100 percent my work by by any means. There was a big there was a large number of people that contributed to it um, because that article was more than just writing the words. Uh, there was a lot of research connected. 
Um, you know, we had meetings with lawyers and stuff. Obviously, there's the possibility that you get sued if you're if you're writing about this sort of thing, and we have to be ready for it. And so, the, yeah, it, it, it's correct to put Lee Chess on the article, okay, because it was a team effort, and more so, not even just writing the article, but sort of having the courage to publish it, because we we make these decisions as a team. So, of course. At one point, we have a vote to say, are we, you know, are we going to publish this article? Are we going to write about that? And that vote is not just, you know, uh, people that wrote the, the article. They're the developers and moderators and everybody else. And the team as a whole agreed to publish the article. So it's, it's you know, I probably worked more on it than anybody, but it, it, it's not fair to call it, you know, only my article. It's it's a Lee Chess article. Okay. And in subsequent times, the St. Louis Chess Club, Club issued what I considered to be sort of a more heartfelt apology for the way that they handled uh, the allegations. Um, what did I mean? I know you don't want to speak for the whole organization, so maybe you could just share your your personal thoughts on on what they said. Sure, uh, it, it's it's encouraging that. The, the this is the the letter that St. Louis released was probably the first time in all of this that any that either U.S. Chess or St. Louis Chess Club had admitted some fault or at least said that they that they hadn't done everything perfectly. And I think, as with most things in life, the cover up is worse than the crime. Although in this case, the crime is pretty bad too. So I don't know if they had. You know, there is a world where the U.S. Chess and St. Louis handle these things in a little, in a more sympathetic way, and there wouldn't have been any, you know, Lee Chess boycott. There wouldn't have been any drama connected with that. If, you know, U.S. Chess or St. Louis or whoever had come forward in the beginning and said, you know, I'm sorry we didn't fire Alejandro Ramirez sooner. I'm sorry we didn't take it more seriously. I'm sorry we hired him to to coach the Olympiad team after we knew what he was. You know, he was our friend and I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt and I didn't react as quickly, you know, we didn't react as quickly as we should have. And I'm sorry if they had done that. It would have been a very, very different set of circumstances, because I think anybody can relate to that, to screwing up or to trusting the wrong person. But instead, they were very unequivocal. We did nothing wrong. Everything was perfect. We handled it perfectly. And, you know, we're not taking any follow up questions. Yeah. So it's encouraging to see St. Louis sort of admit what everyone kind of already knew that they that they screwed up. It remains to be seen going forward how seriously they will take stuff going forward and, you know, how much teeth these new reporting mechanisms uh, they have will eventually, you know, what, what effect that will have. OK, yeah. And so just just to be clear for listeners for context. So Chris is saying that prior to this most recent statement, which I'll read a, a, a portion of in a second, they were not very um, contrite in in Correct. addressing how they um, handled the situation. Um, but this statement, which was October 2nd, 2023, I won't read the whole thing, but they say in part, our, quote, our greatest concern is for those who are were assaulted or harassed by Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez and were deeply sorry for the pain it caused. We also realized the St. Louis Chess Club should have done more to address the allegations made by those who bravely came forward with information about his inexcusable behavior, unquote. So, yeah, I agree. I was certainly glad glad to see that. And, um, yeah, it's been a tough issue all along because you don't, or at least I personally have not necessarily felt like they were these organizations were acting in bad faith. But that only gets you so far, especially when they're, are victims, you know, dealing with uh, like life-altering trauma uh, based on uh, things things that have transpired. Um, so it, it's somewhat heartening to to see to see things move a bit in the right direction. Has there been any dialogue with uh, with U.S. Chess? There has not been any uh, dialogue since the article came out. The last, I believe, uh, emails exchanged that I'm aware of between Lee Chess and them was the request for comment, the unsuccessful, more or less unsuccessful request for comment. Yeah. Um, not, not that I would be against uh, talking to them or negotiating, you know, it, it would be, it would, it would make me very happy to sort of make peace and be able to collaborate again with those two organizations. Cause we worked with them a lot in the past. 
And there, there are people at both orgs that I consider friends and that I enjoyed working with. You know, U.S. Chess is a charity just like Lee Chess is a charity. It's, it's sad that we can't combine our forces and work together because of this situation. Yeah, well said. Um, and on the topic of women in chess, we have a question from a Patreon supporter, Chris Wainscott, um, who notes that you're a part of the Women in Chess Foundation. Uh, some listeners may have heard my recent interview with uh, Amelia Castello, uh, the CEO and co-founder. And Chris says, rumor has it that you'll be staffing booths at tournaments. Is that true? And if so, how can someone volunteer for that? That is that is absolutely true. A um, a staple of of organizing and, and charities, etc., is something that's called tabling, and it's it's pretty simple. You set up a table at a well trafficked area. Uh, you have some brochures and other literature. You have a little dish of candy that causes people to you know come closer and grab a piece of candy, <laughs> and you spark a conversation. Hey, how's it going? And, you know, take a look at my brochure, and you you find donations and you find volunteers and you raise awareness of the organization and i've done it for a number of different orgs over the years and i am planning to do it uh in about two or three weeks for the women in chess foundation uh at the north carolina open right here in sunny charlotte north carolina where i was born and raised excellent but uh, so are you going to be taking a show on the road to beyond north carolina or t- <laughs> tbd yes yeah, to, to the extent that, that uh, travel can be organized with my family commitments, I would love to do that at lots of tournaments. And I would love, I would love to not be the only one. I, I think that we'll probably uh, be sending lots of people out to lots of different tournaments all over the world to do this sort of thing. Excellent. Yeah. And to, to the other half of Chris's question, I believe that there is a link for volunteering um, within, uh, within the Women in Chess's webpage. So, I'll link to that as well. And I know that they're still training advocates as well. So uh, that that might be a, a first step. Um, well, Chris, I feel like at least from my perspective, we have hit the major Lee Chess topics. Are there any uh, glaring omissions in your mind? <laughs> I, I, my, uh, the correct uh, te- technique here for like media uh, liter- is literacy is that I have to like say something. I have to maximize my perpetual chess podcast time <laughs> and talk about Lee Chess for every second that you make available. So uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> come read some Lee Chess blogs. Uh, come play on LeeChess.org. Make an account. Go to womeninchess.com and volunteer to be an advocate or donate, et cetera, et cetera. That's that's about all I have. Okay, excellent. And I will direct listeners for anyone who did not hear our interview from two years ago. Uh, you know, the first half of it or so is a lot of a two years ago version of what this interview was. A lot of sort of the state of Lee Chess, what's going on, how do we stop cheaters, so on and so forth. But then in the second half, Chris drops his own hot takes about, uh, you know, adult chess improvement and how chess teaching could be better. So, and uh, they, they hold up well. So uh, any curious listeners can go back and listen, if nothing else, to the, the back half of the, uh, the second interview for all of Chris's takes. Well, Chris, as always, you know, can't express enough gratitude for, for all the volunteers at Lee Chess. I mean, it's such an amazing website and such an, I mean, it's a, it's more than a website. It's like a social experiment. So, so I, we appreciate you and, uh, and uh, appreciate everyone else working on on behalf of Lee Chess. Yeah, thanks for having me. Talk, we'll talk again soon.